Well, good morning, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today in the 1115 service? Man, we are so excited that you are here today. Glad you're with us in the house or joining us online today. We're super excited that you're here. We believe that God has some great things in store for you today. We believe that God has some great things in store for you today. You know, it, it really is amazing that as our expectation happens, that's how we actually learn how to receive. And so what, what I'm praying is that you'll just kind of get some expectations out there, believing God to do some extraordinary things where he puts his extra upon your ordinary and does extraordinary things in our hearts and lives. Hey, something I want to encourage you uh, is to possibly take notes. I've been talking about this a little bit, especially because I believe that God's going to say something to you today. Uh, he's going to speak something that maybe I said or just... Uh, correlated with something that I said or a worship thing you've already heard, man, you write that down, you'll remember it forever. It's so wonderful. I, every time, almost every time that I'm in a service, I'm always taking notes because, man, God is always downloading stuff into my life. So, again, want to really encourage you to do that. And one final encouragement is that I don't know if you know, but, but preaching was never designed to be a monologue. It was actually designed to be a dialogue, like we're actually talking and connecting. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but you, you've got something real you're really excited about uh, or really you know you just can't wait and the person you're talking to uh, looks like they're bored to death have, have you ever had that and you start kind of whimpering down because you're thinking I thought this was exciting but they don't seem that excited about it well just so you know you might feel like you're lost in a crowd today but I could see every one of your faces I notice every time you yawn every time you pick up your phone and show somebody something you just saw on Facebook I see it all okay I'm not trying to say I'm like God or anything like that, but I just see it all. And, and what, what helps me to preach and really gets me excited, even more excited about the word that I'm actually already excited about is when you get excited about it. So I want to encourage you not to, to kind of mail in this time, really activate. And I believe God's going to say some incredible things to you. All right? So, hey, let's stand up. We're going to make some declarations over our life. Man, we do believe the tongue has the power of life and death. So every, every service, we like to kind of get ourselves warmed up, reminding ourselves who our God is, who we are in Christ, and the power of his word. So y'all ready? Let's make these declarations together. God is who he says he is. God will do what he says he will do. I am who God says I am. I can do all things through Christ. God's word is truth. God's word is alive and active in me. And now because of what Christ has done, I am highly favored, greatly blessed, and deeply loved. Let me pray over you today. Father, we just thank you, God, that you're so amazing. We really do. We want to we want to just pause and God just thank you that you're so amazing, God. That you you do so many good things in our life. And Lord, there are so many good things that you're doing all the time that we don't even recognize and we don't even see. Times you protected us from ac accidents. Times, Lord, that you have kept us from getting a disease. God, times that that you have helped us to make the right decision when we were just about ready to make the wrong decision. And so, God, we just want to come today, God, recognizing that we are standing today in awe of you. Lord, that you are God and we're not. And so, Lord, we pray today, Father, that you would, that we would make room in our heart for you. We'd make room for a word that you might have for us today. That we'd make room, God, for what you might want to do in our hearts and lives, God, to, to continue to direct our paths. So, Lord, I pray today, God, that our, that our hearts would be open and that as your Holy Spirit comes... Lord God, that, that it would just fill our hearts and fill our lives. And God, that we would begin to sense your presence, God, that we would not leave this place the same way that we walked in here. That we would be forever changed because of your Holy Spirit working in our lives. So thank you, God, for your goodness and your faithfulness and your love towards us. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verse 13. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 13. Today, I, I want to talk about, we've been in a series called This Is How You, and so I want to talk about this is how you activate faith today. And uh, just to let you know, I'm, I'm really wound up about this message today, okay? So I, I got to uh, give you a heads up because I've been preaching it to myself um, all week long, and, and I don't know how you feel about hearing the word of God and hearing the promises of God, but it actually starts to stir up something inside of me that my, my spirit man that might be getting a little dull to the things of God begins to become awakened, and it begins to talk to my soul, and it begins to talk to my body, and it, it literally begins to change. So... If I take off running around the room, just giving you a heads up about that ahead of time, all right? 
probably won't happen, but just in case it does, because I want to talk today about activating faith. And I want to talk about the life of faith and, and start off by saying that as followers of Jesus Christ, what we're actually called to do is to live a life of faith. Now, I imagine if you've been in church for any period of time, most of you are going, yeah, duh, we know that, you know, and, and we do know it up here somewhere, but a lot of times it misses coming down here. And we think as followers of Jesus Christ that we are called to live a life of feeling. Ooh, I felt the presence of God. I didn't feel the presence of God. So he was there or he wasn't there. He's always here. Whether we feel him or not, it's not a life of feeling. It, it, it's not a life of what we see. All right, because it's a life of faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for before the evidence of the thing is seen, meaning we see promises in the word that haven't shown up in our life yet, but by faith, we choose to believe the promises. So it's not based on what we see. It's not even based on what we fully understand. Because there's some things, I've been a follower of Jesus Christ literally almost all my life outside of a few crazy teenage years where I kind of ran from him, but... He's speaking to me fresh things and new things all the time. And it's because he's God and I'm not. So he's calling me to live a life of faith. So I, I want to talk to you today about the type of faith that only followers of Christ can have. Only believers can have. And it's, a, it's, a, a faith, it's the faith of God or a God kind of faith. Okay? Because everyone can have faith. Everyone can have faith in someone or in something. In fact, it's one of the reasons why we deal with disappointment so often is we put our faith in someone rather than God. Or, or, or like, like a president, right? Because we all think when our guy gets in or our gal gets in, all right, things are going to change. Listen, it's not. We're still going to have some problems. We're still going to have some issues. We, we put our faith in something like the economy. Yeah, my faith's in the economy. And then we get disappointed when the economy goes up or when it goes down. And then we get real excited about it when the, the economy goes up. So we all can put our faith in something, but only believers can have a God kind of faith. That when you became a child of God, he put faith on the inside of you. And, and what it does is it makes a supernatural difference in your life and in other people's life. God wants to put his super upon your natural and do supernatural things in your life. Now, immediately, you're probably thinking of maybe something that might seem a little weird, but I'm telling you, there's natural things all the time, a financial setback, God wants to put his super bring in financial blessing. You got a health issue, God wants to put a super on top of it and healing take place. So he wants to put his supernatural on us and others all the time. So I wanna ask you a question that I really, you, don't, you can respond out loud if you want, but really more just to contemplate. Don't you get tired of the devil beating up on you? Don't you get tired of watching the devil beat up on other people in your life that you love and care about? Do, do you ever get tired of him wreaking havoc upon your life, upon other people's lives that he just seems to be causing all this chaos and problems all the time? See, we, we know, at least we should know, that Jesus is supposed to be ruling and reigning in our lives, not the devil. We are the ones that are to rule and reign in this life, not the devil. All right? We're, we're not supposed to be living under the circumstances or under the problems. We're supposed to be living above the circumstances or above the problems. So, so when you're talking to somebody and they're going through a difficult time and you say, hey, how are you doing? They're going, well, I'm doing okay under the circumstances. Why don't you remind them, what are you doing under the circumstances when God says you're supposed to be above the circumstances? See, we should be living a life of faith where faith isn't something that we just heard about. It's not something that we heard in a message or we go, okay, yeah, that faith thing. But literally, faith is operational in our lives. It, it, it's a part of our lives. And again, not just our churchy lives, but it's a part of every avenue and area of our lives where we are daily living by faith. So you may be asking, Pastor Richie, is it really that important? Because you know what? I prayed that prayer with you, you know, a few weeks ago. I prayed the prayer a few years ago or whatever. Is it really that important? Well, here's what the writer of Hebrews said about the issue of faith. And without faith, Hebrews 11, 6, it is impossible to please God. Without faith operating in our lives, it's impossible for you and I to please God. So I, I guess we really have to ask the question, how important is it to you and I to be pleasing to God? 
Is, is, is Jesus the, the focus of your life and the center of your life? Or is he just somebody you're kind of working in, especially when you need him in your life? How important is it to you to be pleasing to God? And, and what I believe about most followers of Jesus Christ that have really had Jesus come on the inside of them, because when that happens, transformation begins to take place. You begin to have a love for the things of God. I think most people like that want to be pleasing to God. We do. We, we might make mistakes. We might blow it. But when we make a mistake, we're going, that's not God's plan. God best for me. Let me make an adjustment. So the question is, how do we get faith operational in our lives? We're, we're walking in it every day because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for it to be a part of our everyday experience because what many followers of Jesus Christ believe, what many Christians believe is that what God did in the Bible, he was able to do those things because those men and women were extraordinary. They were, they were kind of those super Christians. You know, they had reached super Christian status. So if they pulled back their robe, they'd have the big S, you know, right there. Super Christian status. They had to reach that before God was actually able to do anything in their lives. So what people begin to wonder because of that is how could God ever work through someone like me? And, and just so you know, I know that you deal with this because I've dealt with this. And I do deal with it occasionally when I listen to the enemy. We, we wonder, how can God work through somebody like me who struggles, who, who makes mistakes, who fails and misses the marks from time to time? But, but here's what the Word of God says, that we have, you, all of us as followers of Jesus Christ, we have that same spirit of faith. That God works through ordinary people like you and I to do extraordinary things upon the face of the earth. Pastor Richie, is, is that really true? Well, let me show it to you here. Our verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Now, I, I want to say this again. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, at some point, you're going to have to make a decision that the Bible is the word of God or it's not. You're going to have to go all in or get out. I would encourage you on that. Because if you're kind of mixing and matching, you're going to be lukewarm. Jesus said he'll spit you out of your mouth. You've got to get to a place where you go, I just simply choose to believe it. I don't understand it completely. Don't get what some of the things happen in the Bible. There are a lot of things that are happening in the Bible that I don't understand why they happen. But I simply choose to believe the word of God. So if this is the word of God, which I strongly believe that it is, I, not strongly, I believe that it is. I have no doubt in my mind that it is. Here's what he says. And since we have that same spirit of faith, all of the heroes of the Bible had, according to what is written, now he's quoting the psalmist, King David here, who the Bible says was a man after God's own heart. And David said this, I believed and therefore I spoke. And so what he's telling you and I to, to do, we also believe and therefore speak. So we have the same spirit of faith that all the heroes of faith had. That, that spirit of faith is living on the inside of you because you're a child of God. Even if it's dormant right now, it's living on the inside of you. And, and the way that we exercise that spirit of faith, and which by the way, it has to be exercised. Because if you don't exercise it, it starts to get kind of flabby. And once it starts to get kind of flabby, it's not really wanting to do anything anymore. It's wanting to lay around, go and feed me, feed me all the time. All right? You, you got to exercise it. You got to develop it. And the way we activate that spirit of faith is very simple. We simply believe and then we speak. We believe and then we speak. We make a choice to believe and then we start speaking the thing that we're believing. Believing what? Believing God's promises. When you open up the word of God and you read a promise, you can start going, whoa, that's for me. You start believing the promises of God. And when you find a promise in the word of God, make a choice to believe it. You're in charge of what you believe. Let me say it again. You're in charge of what you believe. Now, you may have heard a lot of people say things over you that you bought into, but you made a choice to buy into it. So if you had negative things spoken over you, you don't have to stay there. You can begin to speak life over you. You can begin to speak resurrection in dead areas of your life over you. And you can see God do things in restoring your marriage, in healing your marriage, in healing relationship with kids, healing your body, healing your finances, restoring things. But here's what we get all the time because we don't think it's a spirit of faith we're walking in. We think it's a spirit of feeling. Well, what if I don't feel like I believe it? Listen, your feelings have nothing to do with it. You don't put your feelings in charge. Don't let your feelings decide what you're going to believe. 
your feelings may be legitimate. They may be right, but they're wrong a whole lot. They, they are with me. So make a choice to believe it. Locate a promise from the word of God and then speak that promise over your situation. Speak it over your circumstance. Speak it over the, the, the challenge that you're dealing with. And we're not ignoring facts. We've got facts and we've got promises. What are we going to speak? We're going to speak promises, not facts. There is power in your words. Let me say it again. There is power in your words. In fact, we talk about it all the time that the tongue has the power of life and death. Here's the verse from Proverbs 18, 21. Look at it. Again, the word of God speaking to you and I. The tongue has the power of life and death. Listen, and, and if you don't believe it, just watch when you get around somebody who's always griping, grumbling, and complaining. You know what I'm talking about. That person walks in the work. They don't walk in your home because they don't live with you, right? But they, they walk in work and they start, man, and all of a sudden everybody just feels the death in the room. Your tongue has the power of life and death. Your words have created power. Listen, what is the challenge in your life that you're dealing with right now? Start speaking God's promises over the challenge, over the situation. Listen, do you need healing in your body? Do you, you need healing in your emotions? Here's one that we don't think about a lot of time, but do you need healing in your past? See, a, a lot of our wrong behavior and our dysfunctional behavior that's happening now is because we got damaged in our past and we never let God heal it. We never let God touch it. I don't care what you need healing for. Listen to what the word of God says. Exodus 15, 26. This is God speaking. I am the Lord who heals you. Here's how he says it in the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body. Talking about Jesus on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed. You need to understand that you were healed 2,000 years ago. Do you need financial breakthrough in your life? You, you, you want to see your finances step up a little bit? Look what Proverbs 10, says. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. Well, Pastor Richie, that's just spiritual richness. No, it's all richness in all areas of your life. Philippians 4, 19, and my God, the God I serve, shall supply all your need according to his riches, not according to the economy, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let me give you a bonus verse for both of them. 3 John, verse 2, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So since we have that same spirit of faith that Abraham had, the word of God says that he just believed the promise of God before he saw it. You, you realize that this was a guy who got promised a son and did not get to see that son for decades. But the Bible says that he believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Since we have that same spirit of faith that Abraham had, that, that Joshua had that led the children of Israel into the promised land. They marched around Jericho and shouted and the walls came down. That's the spirit of faith that rests in you, rests in me. Since we have that same spirit of faith that Peter had, that Paul had, that Mary had, we believe, so therefore we speak. Listen, if you ever want to know what you believe, listen to what you're speaking. Listen, listen to your voice because you are speaking out all the time what you believe. Literally all the time you're saying out loud what you believe. And if you recognize that what you're believing doesn't line up with the word of God and you want to change it, which by the way, you're going to have to make a decision to change it. If you recognize that what you believe isn't lining up, start speaking God's word. Start speaking God's word instead of how you feel in the moment about your circumstances, about your challenge. Now listen, we all get blindsided by a problem. Something happens and we ah, say the wrong thing occasionally. Hopefully we're getting better at that. Don't stay there. Don't get stuck. Don't get stuck. And just so you know, this is much easier to understand intellectually than it is to put into practice. Because I think every one of us would say, oh, man, I don't ever want to speak death. And then I listen to people, and they're talking about the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem. Again, you can acknowledge the problem. You know what? I'm dealing with some sickness right now, but I'm thanking God today that by his stripes I'm healed. You know what? 
I had a financial situation where a bill came in that I wasn't expecting or we had this financial setback. You know what? But I'm thankful today that the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and it adds no sorrow to it. You, you see the difference? It's we believe, therefore we speak. So you activate the, and, and again, develop and exercise that spirit of faith by believing and speaking. We saw Jesus put this principle into practice in Mark chapter 11. Jesus one day is walking past a, a fig tree that he should have been producing figs at that time. He walked up and there were no figs on the tree. He cursed it. Comes back the next day and the Bible says that it was withered from the roots. Powerful. The disciples were amazed about what had happened. And here's what Jesus said just a few verses later. And so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Another way you could translate this from the Greek is have the faith of God. Okay, but have faith in God. You and I, we are to have this God kind of faith. What faith is it? It's the faith that we're looking at here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We believe and therefore we speak. We believe, therefore we speak. Are you seeing this? Are y'all go ahead and nod? Go, yeah, we're seeing this, Pastor Rich here. No, we're not seeing this. So what we think was, yeah, but that's Jesus. And, and I really, I really can't do what Jesus did. Well, what did Jesus say that you and I would do? L let me show it to you. John 14, verse 12. Jesus is talking, telling you and I, he's saying this: most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me. Notice that the belief is in Jesus. Okay? Not, not in the circumstances. It's, the belief is in Jesus. Belief in what? Belief in his word. Belief in his goodness. Belief in his love for you and I. Belief in the fact that he loves his children enough that he wants to do good towards us. Listen, listen. Belief in who he is, not just what he does. Let me, let me put it this way for you. My belief in who God is is right up here. What he does for me is right down here. It's, it's the next notch down. I'm thankful and I'm believing God for things. But when this doesn't show up, that doesn't change this. Because God's timing is not always on my timing. God's ways are not always my ways. And there may be something he's working on me that I'm asking for that he doesn't want me to have because I'm not ready to have it. I'm not responsible enough. Or it just may be damaging to me or to my family. So my faith is always right here. So again, Jesus talking, John 14 says, he who believes in me, the works that I do. If you ever read the New Testament, saw the works Jesus did, amazing. He will do also, and, and notice this, greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Because he sent the Holy Spirit to you and I to empower you and I to walk in the life of faith he's called us to do. So how do we do that? With this God kind of faith. That's how we do it. That's why we are to exercise it. Yes, sir. We are to develop it. We are to activate this God kind of faith in our lives. And I know for some of you, you're dealing with the qualification issue right now. The devil's telling you you're not qualified. I'm telling you, if you've given your life to Christ, you're qualified. I don't, I don't care. I don't care if you pulled in the parking lot today and the parking attendant didn't let you park where you wanted to park and you started cussing them out and still walked in here. I want you to know you're still qualified today because of what Jesus Christ has done. I don't care if you fought with your spouse all the way to church today, said some things you shouldn't have said. You are still qualified today. So then in the next verse, Jesus tells us how we are to do that. Verse 23, watch this, what he says. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain. Now remember that a mountain is an obstacle or a problem that you're dealing with. It's not talking about a physical mountain. It's something that you're dealing with. See, we spend way too much time talking to God and asking him to fix the problem when he's actually wanting you and I to exercise an authority that he has actually given to us about the mountain. So he says, whoever says to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. It's the same principle that we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We believe, therefore we speak. Again, this is how we exercise our faith, develop our faith, activate our faith. 
Let me, let me ask you this. How did God exercise his faith? I mean, think about it for a moment. Going back to Genesis, when, when he said, let there be light, did he say, let there be light and then climb off of his throne and get his uh, light-making tools and start making light and start creating light? No. He spoke. He spoke. Our doing things, and watch this, our doing things can be the response of faith, but we can't be doing things to try to get faith to operate in our lives. Let me say that again because you, we really need to understand that. Listen, our, our doing things can be the response of faith, meaning we had a situation, we began praying, God, what, what do you want me to do? I'm resting in you. Resting is not just laying around doing nothing. If you lost your job and you're believing God for a job, you don't lay at home and go, well, God, if you want me to have a job, you're going to have somebody call me up. Not going to happen. But you're resting in it going, God, you've got a job. So now I'm going to go out and respond in faith in God and looking for some open doors because I believe you've got a better opportunity. That's different than, God, I'm going to do something so you'll do something. Is that making sense? See, we want to perform to try to get miracles. And so we think if we really lived well all week, okay, God, now you could go ahead and bless me. Seriously. You know what amazes me all the time is the weeks that I don't do quite as well, it seems like it's the week that God blesses me the most. Now, I'm not advocating sinning and I'm not advocating doing the wrong things. All right, so please, please, please hear me on that. But God just in his grace and mercy just does things in spite of me. So again, we want to try to perform to make the miracles happen in our life, but God kind of faith is believing and speaking. I simply choose, I read something in the word of God, I simply choose to believe it. Do you know how God sees you as a child of God? Do you know who you are, let me put it that way, as a child of God? I, every time I, I think about this, I think of Simba. Right, Lion King, the original one, came out like 250 years ago when I was a kid. <laughs> you, you remember he kept saying that? Who, who you are, remember who you are. Do, do you know who you are as a child of God? Oh, Richie, I just prayed this prayer and I'm just kind of hanging around till Jesus comes back. Isn't that what it's all about? No, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Every time God does something supernatural in your life, you realize it's a testimony of his goodness and grace in your life. So do you know who you are? Let, let me read a couple of verses that I hope will help you understand who you are as, Christ, as a Christ follower. Ephesians 2.6 says this, and God raised us up with Christ and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You, you need to know today that God is seated at the right hand of the throne. And we spiritually are sitting right next to him. We're, we're, we're there. We're in this position of authority. 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen generation. He's talking to us. A, a royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. That's who you are as a child of God. We are seated with Christ as king priests. God has given to us and placed us in a position of authority so that you and I could rule and reign. You remember when Jesus went back to the, the father and, and he was saying, go therefore. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. You see, it was given to Adam in the garden of Eden and Adam gave it away when he sinned. So God had to come back and restore authority that he's given back to you and I. And so he's given you and I an authority to rule and reign. Therefore, we believe, we believe God's promises. We believe the situation that we're going through is just an opportunity for God to do something extraordinary. So we believe, therefore we speak. By the way, how many times did Jesus say believe in verse 23 versus how many times did he say um, ask or um, say or speak? Look at it, look at it with me again. For surely I say to you, this is Jesus talking in, whoever says, says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says, he will, it will be done, he will have whatever he says. He says three times says and one time believe. You, you see that Jesus is emphasizing our, our saying more than believing. Why would he do that? Because he really wants us to understand the more you say, the more you'll believe. 
Let me say that again. He's trying to emphasize the more that you say, the more that you believe. That's why when you begin to hear a promise and begin to understand it, you may not fully believe it yet, but you start saying it over your life and saying it over your life and saying it over your life. All of a sudden, you just believe it. You, you may not understand it fully yet, but you start believing it. What happens is you literally start rewiring your brain. Yeah, honestly, the, the neuroplasticity, I think is what it's called, that it literally, your brain is literally changing all the time by the words that you're saying over your life. Are you beginning to see that the tongue has the power of life and death? We believe, therefore we speak. Because I know what happens in churches. People don't want to say it out loud. You know, they, I mean, they, they don't want to say it in front of people for sure, but they, they, they struggle saying it out loud. And so they'll say, well, I believe it in my heart. I don't really think that I need to say it. It doesn't work like that. It, it doesn't. Listen, the spirit of faith is believing and speaking. It's believing and speaking. I mean, we see it with salvation to give your life to Christ. Romans 10.10 10 says this. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, meaning God, I want what you, I believe in that. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. See, speaking and prayer, they go together. Because right after this verse in Mark 11, where Jesus says, believe, speak, and it will happen. Here's what he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Whatever things you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. So again, we see that speaking and prayer go together. Let me, let me paraphrase it a little bit so you can maybe grasp the Greek understanding a little bit better. Whatever things you ask when you pray, you're, you're praying for a home. Maybe you've got a house, but it's not a home. Maybe there's all kinds of chaos. You want a home. You want healing in your body. You want deliverance from a bad habit. You want financial breakthrough. You want restoration. You want your womb to be open. You want your pocketbook to be filled. You want God to do something supernatural in your life. Be believing that you are receiving and you will have them. So when you are praying, always be believing that you are receiving Again, my confidence is in God. The timing's up to him, but my confidence is him. I'm believing that I'm receiving. For example, when you pray, Lord, I thank you that, you that I have your grace and favor, which, by the way, I pray this on myself all of the time. I do. I walk around, and I have favor with people, and I have, God does grace-oriented things in my life simply because I pray it all the time. Thank you, Lord, that I have your grace and favor resting upon me. And I, and I want to be a little bit like the Apostle John. God, I thank you that I'm your favorite one. I know my wife thinks she's the favorite one, but I think I'm the favorite one. Always be believing that you are receiving. Okay? Your prayer doesn't always have to be a request. Sometimes it's a declaration. Sometimes it's, Lord, thank you that I'm the head and not the tail. God, I thank you that I'm above and not beneath. God, I thank you that I'm blessed going in, that I'm blessed going out. God, I thank you that I'm blessed in the city, blessed in the country. God, I'm thankful today that I'm the one that you love. It can be a declaration. So again, since we have that same spirit of faith that the heroes of faith had, we believe, therefore we speak. So let me show you as I kind of begin to close today an example of one of the heroes of faith that we find in the Bible, Elijah. Okay, and I don't know if you know Elijah's story in the Bible, but it's great read in 1 Kings chapter 16, 17, somewhere around there, but it's a great read. And here's what James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote in James chapter 5, verse 17. He says this about Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. You know what that means? It means that Elijah dealt with the same issues that you and I deal with. He did. We, we think that be, because he was a man of God, he didn't deal with the things that we deal with. But, but he dealt with fear. He, he did. After he had slaughtered the prophets of Baal, the, the queen said, you know what, I'm going to kill you. And he ran. I mean, he just killed 450 prophets of Baal. And now is it Jezebel? Is that her name? Jezebel says, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. And he ran. He got fearful. He got depressed. Found himself on the backside of the desert crying out to God, God, I'm the only one left. Doing the whole doom, despair, and agony on me thing again. Which, by the way, are, are you all familiar with Hee Haw? Show of hands if you've seen Hee Haw before. Okay. I'll have to do the whole routine for you one time. The doom, despair, agony on me, but not today. 
He dealt with depression. He had bad days. He had days when he was grumpy. He, he had days when he didn't feel like a man of God. The Bible says that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And listen, this gives us great hope that you and I don't have to be perfect to operate in faith. We can operate in this faith even in the midst of our imperfections. Because I want to let you off the hook. It's not about you. Let me, let me say it again. It's not about you. We want to make it all about us. Oh, God, I can't because of this. And God's going, no, it's not about you. It's about me. It's about me working in your life. It's about me working through your life. Because when I do that, you get blessed and other people around you get blessed. It, he, he can work in the middle of imperfection. So again, Elijah was, was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly. I want you to hold on to that. This first time he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Verse 18, and he prayed again, all right? Remember that too. And the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Now, when, when you look at this story in 1 Kings where the Bible says that he prayed earnestly and it didn't rain, he isn't praying what you and I would consider like a traditional prayer. You don't see him down on his knees, you know, head bowed, hands up to heaven, whatever it's. You find him declaring. You find him declaring something to King Ahab, who was the king, who because he had allowed worship idol in the nation of, of Israel, he is now declaring a promise that he's about ready to say. Here's what Elijah declared to King Ahab. As the Lord God of Israel lives, this is the earnest prayer, by the way, before whom I stand, there shall not be due nor rain these years except at my word. There's, there's no record of, again, of what we would consider Elijah praying a, a, a traditional prayer. God calls believing and speaking earnest prayer. Are, are you all tracking with me so far on that? So fast forward three and a half years later, the people have repent, repented of their idol, idol worship. And, and Elijah had prayed, and, and God sent fire from heaven. Again, it's a fascinating story in 1 Kings. God, God sent fire from heaven. Again, he, he slaughters the prophets of Baal, and now the people of Israel are turning their hearts back to God. So Elijah goes up to Mount Carmel where he prays, and he, and he bends down, and he puts his face between his knees, and he begins to pray. And he sends his servant out to look and say, hey, is there, is there a, a cloud coming? And six times he goes out and comes back and says, there's, there's nothing there. So he continues to pray, and on the seventh time, he says, there's a cloud the size of a man's hand rising up out of the sea. Not long after that, it began to rain. So which time when Elijah spoke would you and I typically call an earnest prayer? Was, was it when he made the declaration, or was it when he made the earnest prayer of bending down, or what we would consider earnest prayer of bending down between his knees? Most of us would say it's when he bent down between his knees and he's crying out to God. We'd see that. But God called that just a prayer. In, in fact, in that passage in James, it says he prayed again. God called the declaration that he had made like a king earnest prayer. See, God called you and I to be kingly priests. He called you and I to have dominion, that wherever we set our foot, the book of Joshua says, that we are to claim for the kingdom of God. And let me tell you something, it works. That you can walk into your workplace and it can be incredibly ungodly. And you can begin to say, God, I'm claiming this territory as a place where your spirit will rule and reign. And you will be amazed at the change that begins to take place. When, when I was going to Bible school in Dallas, I worked at Chili's in the Dallas area. And when I first got on, on, the, on the wait staff there, it was the most ungodly place in the world. I mean, people were, they were just horrible, incredibly ungodly. And I began to pray for them. And I began to pray for God to do a miracle in there. And God took some people out. And God saved a lot of people at that work. And I'm telling you that God has called you and I to have dominion. He's called you and I to rule. You, you got to know who you are as a prince or a princess in the kingdom of God today. You got to know who you are as a child of God. He's called you and I to reign. So do you know what a king does? He doesn't do anything. He speaks and he declares. Listen, they should have known that Jesus was the king because when he spoke, sickness left, disease left, demons fled when he spoke. They should have known that he was the king of kings, which, by the way, do you know why he's the king of the kings? 
because he is the king of all of the kings of this world, but he's the king of all kings, meaning you and me as kings that he wants us to rule and reign at. He's our king. And, and I want you to understand that the devil doesn't want you operating in this kind of faith. He, he wants you to keep going back saying, God, God, would you do it? God, would you do it? And God goes, I've already done it. I've already given you the authority. I've already called you as a chosen people, a, a royal priesthood. Start stepping into it today. Listen, we are in a war. We are in a war. That's why we deal with attack on our lives. Listen, it shouldn't surprise us when problems happen. That's why Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. But I want you to know today that the devil is fearful of you operating in the authority that God has given you as a child of God, the authority of a kingly priest. He's, he's afraid that you're going to begin to establish in your life and others what God's word says about you, what God's word says about others, what God's word says about your situation, your circumstance, your challenge. He's afraid you're going to get understanding what the word of God says about it. So let me, let me close again with our verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 13. And since we have that same spirit of faith, man, I, I hope you believe that. Again, you're going to have to make a choice to believe it because I know the enemy is going to be just nonstop yapping in your ear. You don't have it. You don't have it. You've got it if you're a child of God. And since we have that same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Since I believe today as your pastor, here's what I want to speak. Here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to open up your heart right now because I want to speak some things over your life. That I promise you, if you'll open up your heart to God, He's going to supernaturally do some things in your life that are going to change your life forever. In Jesus' name, we are healed today. In Jesus' name, we are healed. We are healed physically. We are healed emotionally. We are healed of things in our past today. In Jesus' name today, we are healed. In Jesus' name, our youth is being renewed like the eagles. Listen, if you've got arthritic conditions and issues in your body where you're feeling defeated, our youth is being renewed like the eagles today. In Jesus' name, we have the healthiest bodies. We have the healthiest minds of anyone in Amarillo. In Jesus' name, our bodies are strong. Our minds are strong. Our emotions are strong. Depression has to leave us today. In Jesus' name, there will be no lack in our lives. There will be absolutely no lack. In Jesus' name, we will be blessed. We are blessed to be a blessing and be a blessing to other people. In Jesus' name, God's favor is resting on us. Listen, God's favor is resting on us for your schooling. For your school and God's favor is resting on you in your career. And listen, if you're here today and all that you have is a job, God wants you to have a career. God wants you to have a position of influence where you're amazed at all of the things that God is doing in your life. In Jesus' name, the blessings of the Lord are on us. They are chasing us down. In Jesus' name, whatever we put our hand to prospers. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. It's all because of Jesus. Could the rest of you, would you mind standing? It's all because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. And because of you, Jesus, we are ready to believe and speak your promises. We believe and therefore we speak. God, I pray that this would be a life-changing moment, God, for every person that's in this room and every person that's watching online right now. God, that they would believe your promises. God, that they would speak your promises. God, that they would stop allowing the devil to make inroads into their life, to keep bringing defeat, that they keep struggling with the same issue, the same fear, the same concern. But God, that you would make them victorious, that you would make them the conqueror, God, that you've called them to be today. So God, I pray that we would believe and that we would speak. I pray today, God, that we would only declare, God, what your word says about us. God, when we have to acknowledge the problem, we would acknowledge the problem, but we would spend time focused on the promise, Lord, today. God, I pray that we would operate in that same spirit of faith. We believe and therefore we speak. God, that we're going to speak your promises over our life today. Just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed if you would. I, I know I'm passionate about this today and I, I, I want you to know why. It's because I get so tired of watching the devil beat up his children. 
and the children not recognizing what God's actually given to you, that he's given you an authority, that that he wants you to learn how to rule. He wants you to learn how to reign as kingly priests in your home, at work, over your own life. Just simply choose to believe. Simply choose to believe and receive. You're going to be amazed at what God's going to begin to do in your life. I'm telling you, some of you, your life is going to be changed forever from this day because you're going to make a choice. God, I, I choose to believe. I, I, don't, I don't fully understand it all. I don't get it all, but God, I choose to believe. And I'm going to put a guard over my mouth and make sure that I'm only declaring your promises, God. I'm going to make sure, God, that I know, God, that you love to do exceedingly abundantly a God above all that we can ask or all that we can think today. So God, breathe life into us today, I pray. Breathe life into us today. I want to pray one final thing. If you're here today or watching online and you've either never given your life to Christ or you're here today going, Pastor Richie, I I prayed a prayer a long time ago or recently, but I'm not where I need to be. And today I'd like to rededicate my heart and life to God. I'd like to lead you right there at your seat in a very simple prayer for you to open up your heart and life, to receive Jesus as your Savior, meaning he paid for your sins but to receive him as your Lord, meaning, God, I'm putting you in charge of my life. And so if you're here today and you've never prayed that prayer or you need to rededicate your life, I'm gonna count to three, and when I do, I'm gonna ask you to slip your hand up and hold it up high for just a moment, and I wanna let you know that we don't want you to walk alone. We wanna help you in your new walk with Jesus Christ. So we wanna get a Bible in your hand, but if you need Jesus in your heart and life, when I hit three, if you'll just slip your hand up and hold it up high for just a moment, one, two, three. Three, slip your hand up and hold it up high for just a moment. Yes, God bless you, young man. God bless you right here. God bless you right over here. Anybody else want to pray with these three? Yes, God bless you, sir, right back here. Want to pray with these four. Anybody else, God's dealing with your heart. First time rededicating your life. You're not joining a church here today or any kind of religion. You're just saying, I want to be a part of the family of God. I want Jesus in my heart and life. Last time I look across, anybody else want to pray with these? Actually, there's five. Yep, I see the hand right there too. Can I invite everybody, if you would, would you just pray out loud with me? Just say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for coming to this earth to pay the penalty for my sin. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you died and rose again, that I might have life abundant and eternal life. So I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life to be my Savior and Lord. It's in Christ's wonderful name I pray. Amen.